Good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to get started. So um, I'm Lisa Tuckman. I am the Chief of the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine here at Children's National Health System. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this very special event. Uh, this is the 34th annual Robert S. Rixey Memorial Lecture. And today is also the concomitant awarding of the 11th Eldal RC Teaching Scholars Award. So please stick around at the end of Dr. Ginsburg's talk just for a couple of minutes so we can honor Elda, her family, and this year's recipient. Um, today's lecture is named in honor of Dr. Robert S. Ripsey, who was a local pediatrician. He trained in our department in the late 1970s. And after finishing his fellowship in adolescent medicine, he joined Dr. Sullivan and Ryan in practice in Alexandria, Virginia, where he quickly established himself as a valuable resource in the community and as an advocate and spokesperson for adolescents. His premature death in 1984 took from us a valued friend and colleague. And through a joint effort with the Robert S. Rixey Foundation of Alexandria, our division is happy to be able to sponsor this remembrance of Dr. Rixey um, on an annual basis. Um, the spirit we have tried to capture in a Robert S. Rixey Memorial Lectureship is well personified by today's speaker, Dr. Ken Ginsburg. Ken is a pediatrician specializing in adolescent medicine at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. He's a professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and serves as director of health services at Covenant Health Pennsylvania. He is co-director of the Center for Parent and Teen Communication, and he practices social adolescent medicine, medicine that pays special attention to prevention and the recognition that social context and stressors affect both physical and emotional health. He co-developed the Teen Center model, which is a mixed qualitative quantitative methodology that enables youth to generate, prioritize, and explain their own ideas. He has more than 140 publications, including 35 original research articles, clinical practice articles, and five books. Dr. Ginsburg is co-editor and lead contributor of the multimedia toolkit, Reaching Teens. It's a strength-based communication tool. The book is called Reaching Teens, Strength-Based Communication Strategies to Build Resilience and Support Healthy Adolescent Development. And a lot of us in adolescent medicine use this religiously. Um, this comprehensive toolkit allows youth serving professionals to apply the integrated principles of positive youth development, resilience, and trauma-informed care. He consults widely on resilience building strategies with youth development and service organizations, including Boys and Girls Clubs of America, Covenant Health International, and services for military-affiliated youth and families. He's been a formative mentor for me and for countless other colleagues, adolescent medicine fellows, residents, and medical students. And this morning, Dr. Ginsburg will provide an overview of building strengths for all youth, including those who are marginalized or who have endured trauma. Ladies and gentlemen, our 34th Rixie lecturer, Dr. Ken Ginsburg. Good morning. Um, what an honor it is to be here um, and to be able to spend the day with Dr. Tuckman's um, division. And what an honor it is to literally stand in the shadow of one of the giants of adolescent medicine, Dr. D'Angelo. I don't know if you know this, but he literally is one of the designers, creators, and shapers of my field. So I'm humbled and a bit intimidated. With that said, um, and to watch one of my mentees become a division head is a joy beyond description. Um, so, I want to focus on one word. First of all, is this on? All right, I want to focus on one word in the title. I want to focus on the word all. And the reason I want to focus on the word all is because the fact is that there are certain people who are deserving of more focused attention and an intenser and higher level of resources. There's no doubt about that. But in the current divisive environment, if we focus only on those young people without coming up with interventions that actually elevate all you, we will lose. So as I talk in just one hour talking about how to build resilience in young people, I want you to think, is there anything that I'm saying 
that actually wouldn't apply developmentally for all units? And the answer is no. All right? Look at his child. Allow yourself to see his face. Right? So this kid has the same crinkles between his nose and his eyes that one of my daughters, Tali, has. That could make me do anything. All right? So this kid is the screensaver on my computer now. Right? Because in this kid's face, do you see joy? Do you see it? Do you see hope? Do you see possibility? Do you see a reminder of why we do what we do? So there is no task that I begin that I don't begin with a, this reminder of hope, joy, possibility, and the reason we do what we do. This kid's on a refugee boat. This kid was on a sinking boat that was just picked up by the Italian Navy. I don't know what happened, but I know they got cold and wet, and I know that from the blanket. I don't know what happened in his life that made it so that the family decided that it was worth risking their lives for a better life. I don't know what happened, but I do know that this young man has already endured more than I've endured in my lifetime. I know that this man is maybe an hour or so away from seeing things I've never seen, probably people screaming, people terrified. And yet, I look at his face, and I see joy and possibility. What is this picture really about? What's really this picture about? Is it about, yes, it's about resilience, but from where does it come? Does it come from the child? It comes from the adults surrounding the child. Look at this picture. And what this picture is really about is about human connection, about human protection, about the power of loving, caring adults in the lives of children. That's what it's about. If you get that emotionally, spiritually, and intellectually, you get everything I could possibly teach. So I do um, up to five-day talks. Um, in one, less than one hour, I'm going to whip through a few objectives. The first thing I want to do is I absolutely want to focus on trauma-informed practice, but I want to do it in the context of positive youth development and resilience. Because make no mistake about it, if we only focus on childhood trauma, we run the risk of undermining young people. We now understand that the body, the brain, the behavior, and indeed genetics is influenced by what happens to you in childhood. And it's just powerful, and we stand at a moment in history that we could really make very dramatic changes based on an understanding of this. But if we don't do it right, it's going to backfire terribly. It runs the risk of making human belie beings believe that the worst thing that ever happens to them defines them and defines their children. We run a risk. So we've got to integrate models. Next, we're going to very quickly talk about how to work with human beings so that you eliminate shame from your interaction and you begin to build confidence within them. We're going to talk about how not to undermine confidence, which means we've got to turn off the adult model of communication, which is based on lecturing. And we've got to come up with a different model. We're going to talk about giving control back to people who have lost control over their lives. And then finally, we're just going to touch on managing stress. Because everything that you fear in adolescence, all of the behaviors, in adulthood as well, that you want people to avoid, whether it's sex out of the context of a relationship, whether it's cutting, whether it's eating disorders, whether it's violence, whether it's drugs, all of it works. It all feels nice. And telling what kids what not to do has never, ever worked. What does work is helping people understand what to do. All right, so for the adolescent medicine folks, I'll be spending the morning with a deeper dive into all these subjects. Right now, I just want to um, present them. All right, so there's a balancing act. We've got to integrate models between positive youth development, resilience, and trauma-informed practice. PYD, I just spent two hours on it, but in a nutshell, what it's about is about what is our goal. And this sentence is what changed my life when I was at your stage. Right? Because I was medically trained, right? And that was about figuring out a risk, giving four to five reasons to tell people to change. And it never made any sense to me because it was never good enough for them not to do drugs. It was never good enough for them not to become pregnant. Problem free is never your goal, Karen Pittman says. The goal is to be fully prepared. And then the question is what are we, how are we going to define success for, again, that word all young people? 
The first thing that we have to do is we have to stop looking at the children in front of us, because when you look at the child in front of us, you make mistakes. You end up looking in the short run, and you end up thinking about primarily their happiness and how they're doing in school, which is important stuff. But what we have to begin doing is looking at every child and imagining the 35-year-old and thinking, what are the ingredients that you need to put into place in order to make that 35-year-old be a successful being, prepared to lead us into the future? And then we begin looking beyond happiness, and we begin looking at meaning and purpose. We begin looking at creating someone who's compassionate, committed to repairing the world, who learns to walk down the street and rather than avert their eyes, understand that something created the circumstance of the individual before us. You need people who are hardworking, who have tenacity, who have grit. You need people who are creative and innovative, people who know how to collaborate, people who can take constructive criticism, people who understand the power and necessity of diversity. And you need people who are resilient, right? Um, because while we wish we could wrap kids in downy quilts, it's not possible. Let's talk about resilience. Resilience is the ability to overcome adversity. It's the capacity to bounce back. If you understand what I'm going to show you now, you begin to understand the biology of uh, resilience, of trauma-informed practice, as well as an introduction into how I work with somatic patients. To understand resilience, what you have to understand is that resilience is a response to stress. To understand stress, what you have to understand is that stress is um, uh, designed into us so that we can be prepared to run from a tiger. Because 50,000 years ago, we were all in the jungle. So here I am in the jungle, and I smell a tiger. What am I supposed to do right now? What should I do? I should run. So the first thing I do is I got to jump. So where do I need the blood? I need the blood in the butt because that's the jumping muscle. So what's the first physical sensation I'm going to have? Butterfly. Why? Because that is the blood rushing from the belly where 50% of it is when you're just chilling to go to the butt so you can run. Isn't that cool? Right? Then your heart beats fast. Why? So you can pump that blood. You breathe fast. Why? So you can oxygenate that blood. You sweat. Why? So you can cool off while you are running. Your pupils are big. Why? So you can uh, jump over the log without, um, uh, you know, tripping so that you don't get eaten. And you can't think clearly during times of maximal stress. Why is that? So scientifically, it's because your blood is in your amygdala and instead of your cerebral cortex, right? That's why. Um, but less scientifically, it's because you're not supposed to turn the tiger and say, I don't know, can we work this out? Nor can you feel. Nor can you feel fully when a tiger's chasing you. Why? Because you're not supposed to turn the tiger either and say, can we talk about what it feels like to you um, to want to eat me? So you cannot think, you cannot problem solve, you cannot make decisions, and you cannot empathize during times of maximal stress. And if you understand that, you begin to understand how to work with people. Because if we can work with human beings and give them the sense of safety and security that makes them understand there is indeed no tiger immediately there, then we can begin to have them think, problem solve, and empathize. And what you will find is that the people who have been through the most are the most compassionate, loving human beings on earth when you create the safety that allows them to bring out the other half of their brilliant amygdala. This slide is life-saving, right? When does resilience reach its limit? So the first thing is, you know, we know when an adolescent is depressed, the 50% of the time when an adolescent looks like they are depressed, we see them, right? We see them exactly. Um, so if you smell, if you're losing weight, if you're gaining weight, if you're sleeping, if you're sleeping too much, we get those kids. Indeed, if you're sad, we don't miss those kids. You know who we miss? We miss the 50% of kids who, when they're depressed, are angry. And right here in this bullet, that is the school-to-prison pipeline right there. When kids who are sad, when kids who have been through it, are misinterpreted as bad, and we miss them, we put them in prison instead of understanding that what they need is healing. The bottom line of resilience, what all the research says from 60 years, is that the kids are going to be all right when adults believe in them without condition and hold them to high expectations. What does it mean to believe in a human being without condition? It doesn't mean that you say, like, Johnny, it's okay to do drugs. What it means is that you are committed to not going anywhere. 
that you will stand beside the child? And what does it mean to hold to high expectations? This isn't about grades or trophies or sports. What this is about is seeing people, seeing people for all of their character, for all of their compassion, for all of their goodness, and never stop seeing them, despite the behavior that might be standing before you. This is the seven C's model of resilience. This is the American Academy of Pediatrics model. This is mine, but it's stolen from and synthesized from the people down here. And you're going to see your three C's interpreted in my seven C's. All right? So the first thing that we have is we want kids to be confident. We knew exactly how to build confidence in kids, right? What we did is we had the self-esteem movement. So for 30 or so years, what we did is we created curricula where kids drew out butterflies in kindergarten, they got put in the walls, and the teachers congratulated all of them as beautiful artists and told them all, you're all as special as butterflies. The next lesson for real, the next lesson was cutting out snowflakes. Um, and then the lesson of the day when they got put on the walls, what do you think the lesson of the day was for snowflakes? You're all unique. Um, coaches were taught not to criticize kids. Parents were taught to praise their child to every interaction. Look at you, Tommy, you're coming down the sliding board. You are so brave and smart and handsome, too. Look at you, you're doing it, you're doing it. Never giving credit to gravity. Look at you, Tommy. What happened to that generation of kids, do you know? Highest levels of anxiety and depression we've ever seen. Do you know why? Do you ever day we don't feel special as a butterfly? Do you have one of those days? We didn't tell the kids it was okay. They didn't feel okay when they didn't feel good. Real confidence does not come from showering vapid praise on people. Real confidence comes from building their skills, competencies. Next, connection. It's one of your C's. There's nothing more powerful than human connection. There's nothing more healing than human connection. It's the scaffolding upon which children rise and develop character, having an understanding of what is right and wrong. The basic definition of character is what would you do if nobody was watching? Tikkun olam, contribution. Really being committed to repairing the world. Why does this matter? Because the ultimate act of resilience is to turn to another human being, say, brother, I need a hand. That's who survives. The question is what makes it safe to reach. And as long as I believe there's pity on the other end, I'm not reaching, which means I will not get services. But when I give, when I give, I learn that it feels good to give. And therefore, when I learn that it feels good to give, it means that when I need to receive, I can do so without shame or stigma. It is a game changer. But it's more than that. Adolescents are raised in a society that rolls their eyes when we talk about them, that crosses the street for too many of them. And when the fundamental question of adolescence is, who am I? And the answer is, I am someone worthy of the eye roll, worthy of the uh, street crossing. You begin to understand the toxicity on human development. The reason we want our kids out there giving service is we want them surrounded by gratitude rather than condemnation. When they give, they rise to become their best selves. <laughs> Coping. We're going to talk about this briefly later, but the bottom line is telling people what not to do isn't what works. And finally, control. I either believe that the world happens to me and that I am just powerless along my journey, or I believe that the actions that I take make a difference. And where does this begin? This begins with parenting. If you are raised by a parent who says, you'll do what I say, why? You feel small. If you're raised with a parent who says, my goal is to have you become independent, my goal is to have you become your best self, my job is to protect you, however, and I'm going to let you fall down and I'm going to give you more and more privileges when you earn them. Then you rise, and you understand that you are in control. Breathe. And I'm going to read this with you. Once upon a time, a town was built beyond the bend of a beautiful river. Children were playing beside the river when they noticed three bodies in the water. They ran for help, and the townsfolk quickly pulled the bodies out. One was dead, so they buried her. One was ill, so they took him to the hospital and nursed him to health. The third was healthy, so they placed her with a family who cared for her and took her to school. Every day, bodies came floating down the river, and every day, people tended to them, taking the sick to the hospitals, placing the healthy with families, and burying the dead. This went on for years. The townsfolk came to expect the bodies, and they developed elaborate systems for recovering and attending to them. Some were generous, and a few gave up their jobs to do it full time. The town developed pride in its generosity and efficiency in its body tending. 
However, during all these years and despite the effort, nobody thought to go upriver beyond the bend that hid what was above them and find out why the bodies came floating down the river. Folks, in 2018, we're at a place in history, in human history, where for the first time we understand where the bodies are floating down the river. We've always known that bad things ran in families. We always know that bad things ran in communities. Then we came up with the only understanding that could explain it, which is that there's something wrong with these people. The othering of humanity, the most destructive force we have all endured. And now we hold the potential of understanding why discrimination, inequity, and oppression create bad things. So when you talk about trauma briefly, I know you had a talk on trauma last week, so I'm not going to revisit. But suffice it to say that we know that what happens to you in childhood um, holds the potential of harming your body, your brain, your behavior, and indeed your genetics. We know that it holds the potential. That is profoundly important, the words that I just said. Because let me tell you that as this is being taught in communities, I'm all over the place. And what I'll tell you is as it's being taught, it's not being taught correctly. Because non-medical audiences don't understand the concept of relative risk. And when you tell them they're more likely to get cancer, all they hear is I'm going to have cancer. When you tell them about epigenetics, all they hear is I've given my children cancer because of the worst thing that happened to me and because of my historical oppression, right? It's backfiring. We have to do much, much better. But let me tell you, the reason that I am in this movement is not, so these are the adverse childhood experiences, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, being neglected, substance abuse, mental illness, domestic violence, incarceration, parents being divorced or parental abandonment. These are the original aces, right? Um, followed up, what we realized is that there was a lot of things missing from those original aces. All right, we um, like where is poverty? Where is racism? Where is being there when your brother got shot? It's not there. Furthermore, when you go back, the original aces, they only measured you up until a high score of four, right? So all the data we have is with a high score, score of four. I have to tell you, I've never met a four. A covenant house, my kids are nine, 10, 11s. So if you go with the expanded aces, they're 12, 13s, and 14s, which means we don't even know the extent of the effect that we are having. But all of this bad news is not what brings me to the movement. Yes, it affects the body, brain, behavior, and genetics. This is why I'm here. Because there's a parallel body of research that says that all of that stuff is true unless you have a loving adult alongside you, primarily Jack Sean Koff, but a lot of other people's research as well, right? That if you have a powerful, loving adult beside you, then all of these bad things that happen to you will not necessarily happen to you. Do you want to know the science behind this? Someone say yes. All right, here's the bottom line. So here I am in my jungle chair, and um, something terrible happens to me. I'm literally about to get eaten. That is adrenaline. Adrenaline, I either run or I get eaten. But what about when it is not a real tiger? What about when it's my daddy in my bedroom? What about when it's pervasive poverty? What about when it's um, uh, racism and unconscious biases that you have to navigate on a daily perpetual basis? What about then? Then I can't just run then what happens is I have to be ready to jump at any time, in any moment, in any direction. What do I need my blood pressure to be, high or low? High. What hormone keeps my blood pressure high? Cortisol. Cortisol makes me eat different food, drink different um, amounts of water, eat higher levels of salt. And what this does is it um, uh, changes my endocrine set points and even my epigenetics. That's what it does. All right? So this is mediated through cortisol. So we know that. And we also know that the grandma protects you. We don't know why, but I'm going to tell you what I think. So we're now in Ginsburg theory, meaning taking two different bodies of science and putting them together before I can prove it. Okay? But we know the grandma is protected. Why? I believe it's because when the grandma looks at you and says, Ken, if your daddy comes home drunk, you're sleeping with me tonight. If, you're, um, if you're, you're, you're not going out of those corners, those boys tell you, tease you, you tell them your grandma said no. Then what happens? 
is I borrow her hypervigilance. I do not need to mount my own cortisol because I borrow my grandma's. That is the power of love. What else do we know about these grandmas? We know that they die too soon. We know that. Because they absorb the pain of the community. They have to raise their own levels of cortisol to such a high level that they sacrifice. And here's the thing. Everyone in this room is being raised to be a grandma or grandpa. That's who we are. Which means that if you implement trauma-informed practice casually, without just as emphatically taking care of the families who care for the children and taking care of us who watch for the children, who choose to be hypervigilant with our lives, you're hurting people. This cannot be implemented casually. The world has always averted their eyes as a coping strategy. We choose not to, thank God for that. But if you are going to be someone who does not avert your eyes, you better understand that you are also deserving of focused attention. Unless until when? So up until pretty recently, the answer is we don't know. We don't know, but gosh, all of the resources. So I've actually had this debate at the United Nations, right, about is it, do we focus on children or is it worth putting any uh, focus on adolescents? And the answer clearly is that if you focus on early childhood, you can stem the changes in the body, the brain, and the behavior. We know that. But what about the adolescents? Now we can say yes. I want you guys to go and look at this. This is nature. This is February. This is about the beginning of um, uh, synthesizing this work with epigenetics. And what becomes incredibly clear is that we can change um, adolescents' um, uh, genetic potential up until right the time they have the babies. And you know how they largely know this? By studying sperm. Isn't that cool? The men seriously matter. All right? Um, so, what does it do to your brain? There are three key elements of the brain that are changed. Let's focus on two. The amygdala, the green part of the brain, the same brain that a frog has, that a toad has, that a bird has that says fly away, is on fire. It is brilliant because it's the reactivity of your amygdala that indeed kept you alive. And the red part of your brain, which is what thinks and which modulates emotions, is a little bit more less organized because you had to deal with survival rather than planning. What does it do to your behavior? So the first thing it does to your behavior is it makes you not trust people, which I have to tell you is really, really hard for me because, like, my whole research, everything I began my career on is on studying human trust. So if you don't trust me, it is just so hard. And another thing is it makes these kids and their families, right, because this is intergenerational, more likely to be reactive, which is – Really, so that's the person who has road rage. That's the person who can't settle themselves in a movie theater when someone else fills the popcorn, right? Right, but for me, it is so hard to be with someone who's reactive because calm is like my strongest or it's one of the things that really, really matters to me. So it's hard for me. And another thing about these kids is that they're more likely to lie to you, you know? And I, I'm a guy who, like, cares so deeply about communication, and I'm a doctor, right? I only have a few minutes. And if you lie to me and I don't know what's going on, it's so hard for me. Right? But why is it? Because if these kids grow up in a house where their daddy um, comes home and opens up the refrigerator and says, hey, who took the last hot dog? And you say, I did daddy, and he throws you against the wall, you very quickly learn to stop seeing hot dogs. And another thing about these kids is they're more likely to confabulate. Have you noticed that when you get close to their truth, like you have a relationship with them, and then you're getting closer and closer to what's really going on, and then they're in Disneyland? Why is that? Because when bad things were happening to them, they remember the Super Bowl stain on the wall and the uh, water stain on the ceiling, but they have no memory of what happened, and they went somewhere else, and that disassociation was the most protective thing in their lives. But it's so hard for me when I'm trying to get to the truth and come up with a plan. And another thing about these kids is that they're less likely to engage, at least immediately. So hard for me because nobody has a deeper level of need to be loved pathologically than I do. Right? So when I don't get the affirmation that I need, it's so hard. Do you see how hard this is for me, right? So I'm not getting um, uh, the truth that I, that I value. I'm um, not getting the calm that I value, the trust. It's so hard if I thought it was about me. Trauma-informed practice begins with knowing what is about you and what is not about you. The only thing that heals between human beings is love. That's it. There's nothing else. And we're going to actually define love in a few minutes. 
And I don't have the capacity to love when I become offensive. And the first step towards my becoming offensive is becoming defensive. And if things are throwing at me that have nothing to do with me, but I take them personally, it triggers my defensiveness, which makes me offensive and reactive, and I cannot heal. So what we want to do is we want to be radically calm, which takes some self-talk, guys. Seriously, I'm going to tell you a little secret. You know how I said I value calm, and I'm really ridiculously calm. I um, mean, the worse and more complex the setting becomes, the calmer I become. And you know what? I'm totally faking. It's not who I am biologically, genetically, spiritually. It's all self-talk. It's all talking myself down, reminding me that what I am seeing is not about me. All right? Um, because when we are radically calm, we do not trigger traumatic-based behaviors. It is the key to de-escalation. It is critical to anticipating a problem, and it is the path to elevating compassion. Let's go there. Trauma does not break kids, nor does it cause brain damage. I will tell you right now that foster care families are less likely to take teenagers. The reason is they're saying, don't give me a brain damaged child, because the science is backfiring. We get all excited about understanding the adolescent brain and understanding the effect of trauma, and we have no idea how people hear it and people hear it, don't give me a brain-damaged child. These kids come to the world with a different kind of credential, right? They have a brilliant amygdala. Their reactivity is what's allowed them to survive. And when we create a state of calm for them, and they don't need to trigger their reactivity, the brilliance of the other half of their amygdala shows, because that is also at the root of compassion and of positive emotion. And when we create the kind of setting where kids can really be themselves and feel safe, my kids, if I was in a desert island, I'd rather be with my kids than anything else. Why? Because they have a protector's brain. You ask these kids what's going on in their lives, they'll say to you, I have an anger problem. It's what they've been told. And they've been giving labels like oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder and my personal favorite, intermittent explosive disorder. The girls all think they're bipolar. The boys have been told they're schizophrenic, right? Um, so here's the conversation. Then let me ask you a question. Do you see problems before other people do? Always. You got a little brother or sister? Both. Yeah? Um, and uh, you watch out for them? Absolutely. What happened to me isn't going to happen to them. Um, do you uh, uh, have any friends? Not many, mostly associates, but a few. Well, how would your real friends describe you? They would say that I get that. They would say, like, I've been told I should be a counselor. Yeah, and you watch out for them? Absolutely. We're like family. Am I describing our kids? Like, this is word for word what they're saying, right? Um, uh, yeah, and if you see trouble before other people see it, are you going to do whatever it takes to stop it? Absolutely. Dude, I don't know you, but I know that there's some very special stuff about you, and I know that if I was on a desert island, I'd want to be with you because you see problems and you protect yourself from them and you care very deeply. You have a protector's brain. And I don't know you, but I know you've earned it. And that is your gift. That is your superpower. That is what you bring to the world. Your challenge is knowing when to keep your cape tucked in, right? Your challenge is knowing when to bring out your superpower and when to actually know that you're safe and that you don't have to be there. That is literally life-changing for kids. I've had, I work with street and gang kids. That's what I do. Kids who have been exploited, and I'm telling you, they just break down crying at the concept of not being labeled, all right? Here are the three key principles of trauma-informed practice. Number one, knowing what is about you and what is not about you, which we discussed from the sanctuary movement, Sandy Bloom, changing your lens from what is wrong with you to what happened to you. And third, giving control back to people from whom control has been taken away. Um, this is the Boys and Girls Club motto. I'm um, their resilience guy. Um, to enable all young people, especially those who need us the most, to uh, reach their full potential as productive, caring, responsible citizens. Here's what I'm going to tell you. 
The kids who need you the most are the ones who push you away. The kids who need you the most are the ones who have no idea that an adult is capable of wiping, helping them wipe their nose. It's not the cutest kid. It's not the most engaging kid. And for people like us who care so much about human affirmation and human connection, it makes us in some ways least ready to do trauma-informed practice because the kids who need us the most aren't giving us the things we need. Tie it together just in like 22 minutes, right? Behavioral change, forward and backward movement, a couple few steps forward, a couple steps back, a few steps forward, a couple steps back, a few steps forward. Where am I right now? Forward. If you're going to be the kind of adult who is a cheerleader as the kids are moving forward, good for you. Tammy, I'm so proud of you for getting straight A's. It means so much to me that you're getting those A's. That kid will feel affirmed. That kid will love you. But you'll never know when your grandma dies and she drops out of school. You'll never know. Because you have predicated your relationship on forward movement. And when you predicate your relationship on forward movement, you will never be there when the kids move backwards. Tammy, thank you for telling me what's going on in your life. I'm so proud of our relationship. Flip the script to maintain the relationships during both forward and backward movement. Behavioral change, several steps. You know, this is um, Ginsburg guys um, meaning dumb it down from all the behavioral change models. First, you have to be aware. Second, you have to be motivated. Third, you have to have skills. Fourth, you weigh the risks and benefits and to decide whether or not you're going to move forward. And then finally, will you maintain the behavior or will you not? And that is based on whether what are the pervasive views of what people like you are supposed to be, which means when we fight for justice, we fight for changing the milieu in which teenagers are described so that when they walk down the street and they say, who am I supposed to be, they get the right answers. That's key to making this. Pre-contemplation. People haven't even begun thought of thinking about it. So what do we do in all of our wisdom when we think about pre-contemplation? We say, gosh, if the kid hasn't thought about it, then they must lack knowledge. Let me bestow knowledge upon them. Dead wrong. All right? Um, what's happening is that shame and demoralization is preventing action, and confidence is what gets it started. What are we going to do? We're going to talk to kids in a different way. This is the field of a kid's life. This kid is smoking marijuana, which is terrible for brain development for adolescents. This kid is selling marijuana, which is terrible not only for himself, but also for his community. And this girl wants to become pregnant. And she's only 15 years old. Does she not understand intergenerational poverty? Like, doesn't she get it? So what do we do? We wrap our hands around the problem, and then we tell them how to change. Young man, do you not understand that marijuana will fry your brain, make you grow breasts, and shrink your balls? All of which is incidentally truish. Um, and how does he respond? Thanks, Doc. Why was he smoking in the first place? What was he trying to become? Numb. He's trying to become numb. He was smoking because of the depth of his sensitivity. And me telling him his balls were going to shrink didn't help. What are we going to do? We're going to listen differently. We're going to listen for something that is behaviorally operational, something that the kid possesses. We're not going to bond with kids by talking about the eagles or the capitals, right? That's not what we're, that's not what we're going to do. We're not going to bond in that way. We are looking for what is already good and right in the human being in front of you, the kid who is resilient in the context of a life that would have destroyed you, the kid who's compassionate despite the fact that he was shown none, the kid who has insight beyond his years. You're looking for what is already good and right. Because when you are going to counsel a kid, counseling 101, I love you. This is but without using the word love because that's creepy. Okay, um, I love you. This is what I feel about you that you possess, your strength, heart, stomach, but I'm feeling worried about you, head. I'd love to join with you in your plan where you are the expert in your plan based on what you already possess but where I know how to facilitate, hands, how can I support you moving forward? Heart, stomach, head, hand, students, get out of your head, return to your instincts. If you do that, 
you'll be able to heal kids. Because when we use this model, based on what is already good and right, we overtake the field of risk. Love is seeing someone as they deserve to be seen, as they really are, not through the lens of the behaviors they've sometimes needed to display. It's important that we understand what this is, because then we can begin codifying and measuring what we do. Do you guys have a Covenant House? I haven't trained this Covenant House yet, but I'm in charge of all the Covenant Houses in terms of practice model, and our mission is to serve with absolute respect and unconditional love. What does that mean? It's got to mean something for me to be able to measure it, for me to be able to replicate it, for me to be able to say that this is the difference we're making. This is what it is. Seeing people differently, without shame, without stigma, as they deserve to be seen, not based on their labels, not based on their behaviors, in the case of our own children, not based on what they're producing. Control. This is the C that's most affected by trauma, but let, let me remind you, we're doing this talking about all youth. This is also the C that is most central to growth and development. Giving kids control over their decisions. For the people who are going to spend the morning with me, I'm going to give you example after example. Here, I'm going to just give you the concept. How do children think? Concretely, they see the world as it is. They don't think about future consequences. As a result, they are easily fooled by people. What do we do to protect them? We watch them. I'm walking through adolescence where you're watching me um, less than ever, but you should be watching me as much or more than ever. And now I'm an adult. How do I think now? What's this thought called? If that was concrete thinking. This is now abstract thinking. Now I understand nuance. Now I understand complexity. You can notice how exquisitely handsome I am, and I'm still not going to let you touch me, right? Like, I understand the complexity and nuance and underlying motivations of behaviors, and that is profoundly, profoundly helpful for me, right? So the first thing you need to know is that only 85% of people ever reach abstract thought. The next thing you need to know is that all people in times of crisis, all people, even residents, okay, go concrete during times of crisis, right? And what, is, and what else do you need to know? You need to know that it's a developmental process and that you learn through experience. So the first time that someone comes up to a 15-year-old girl and says, I love you, she usually doesn't say, I question the veracity of that statement, <laughs> right? Um, so um, you learn through experience. And gosh, we know that, but it's so hard to let kids learn through experience. It's just so hard. So what do we do? We tell them. Don't you know that what you're doing right now, which I'm going to call behavior A, could easily lead to consequence B? I never imagined my little girl doing consequence B. Now I wonder what's between the ears besides cobwebs. If consequence B happens, you're more than likely to go on a consequence C, which you never would have done if you didn't begin to hang out with Lisa, whose own mother doesn't love her and you're letting her influence you. If consequence C happens, you're more than likely to go on a consequence D, more than likely to go on a consequence D, which you've never even thought about, which could lead easily to con Look at me, young man, when I'm talking to you. Consequence F, which could lead to consequence G, slippery slope down to consequence H, which more than likely is going to go to consequence I. And you know what happens if consequence I happens, do you? You die. And what does the kid hear? Die. Because this is the mathematical structure of the lecture. This is the mathematical structure with which adults classically communicate with kids. There are all sorts of mysterious variables that intervene, in, um, intervene with each other, uh, interface with each other in a way that we barely understand, creating an outcome that's predictable. Right? Nobody understands what we're saying. We are dis because it is too abstract. So when you're talking to someone in crisis, when you're talking to someone who's not particularly bright, or when you're talking to someone who just is an adolescent and haven't, doesn't yet have the brain that can understand this, we disempower them. The secret to communication is I don't have to teach you new stuff. I need to teach you how to change the mathematical structure of your communication to simple third grade math. Oh, you're thinking about doing behavior A. I hear you. But I worry sometimes that that leads to behavior B. Now, tell me what you're going to do to make sure that behavior B doesn't happen. You guide. You facilitate. You listen. And when the kid is a B and only when the kid is a B, do you take them to C. And when they're at C and only when they're at, um, at C, you take them to D so that they get it, get it, got it, own it. 
We become facilitators, understanding that kids are the experts in their own lives and help them to figure things out on their own. They do not rebel against our solution because they're theirs, not ours. Resilience. It's about learning to cope in a positive way with life's inevitable stressors. And we do our greatest good by raising kids with a wide repertoire of positive coping strategies. And make no mistake about it, um, people who can choose positive coping strategies gain control. Here's the model. Stress is incredibly uncomfortable. It makes you sweat, it makes you smell, it makes you not be able to think clearly. It's so uncomfortable, you gotta do something about it, right? You gotta do something about it. And doing something about it is called coping. Now there are positive ways of coping and there are um, negative ways of coping, right? And the negative ways of coping, if you interpret that as, gosh, they're negative, meaning they don't work, then you're missing the point. They actually work really, really well. These are your quick and easy fixes. And whenever you hear the word quick in the context of behavior, the next thing you should think of is the word addiction which should pop into your mouth. This is cutting, this is drugs, this is sex out of context of relationship. They're negative not because they don't work. They're negative because they work so well that they increase the cycle and harm people's lives. Our challenge in secondary prevention is to work with people who are already doing these things and instead of condemn them, congratulate them and heal them and invite them in the healing process to consider something else. In primary prevention, and the reason why, like so I write the Academy books on resilience, and the reason we got started on these is um, to make sure that parents of two-year-olds could begin raising their kids with a wide repertoire of positive coping strategies, right? You want to make a healthy adult? Think about adolescents. You want to make healthy adolescents? Think about two-year-olds, all right? That's because we want the path of least resistance to be right there. So, for the people who are spending the morning with me, I'm giving you a comprehensive stress reduction plan. By the time we're done, you will be able to work with the kid and work on all the things that are based on evidence. We'll teach them how to cope in different ways. I can't do that for Grand Rounds. I want to make a point. When we talk about stress, the worst thing is not to be stressed, it's to be numb. And I want to talk about you and your being the grandmas and your bearing witness to unspeakable pain and your being the grandpas. And I want to talk about our kids all at the same time to begin thinking about professional longevity as we bear witness to truth that other people have their eyes towards. Things happen, we see them, and they come in all sorts of different directions. And you know what we wish? We wish that we could process and feel everything because of so much, but it keeps coming in all sorts of different directions. You see children die, you see children abused. If your eyes are open, you realize that the main driver of health has very little to disease, to do with disease, and everything to do with oppression and marginalization. And it keeps coming, and you wish you could deal with it, but it's hard to deal with it. It keeps coming. You've got to maintain your sanity, right? Because if you don't maintain your sanity, you're not going to be able to move on. So I will tell you that I didn't cry for seven years. I didn't cry from the time I was a second-year resident. And I went into a room, and it was up in the PICU, and um, the attending, it was a new chef, said, um, go and tell that father that we've just declared his two girls brain dead and ask if he wants to donate their bodies. And I went into the room. That was my training, by the way. Um, I went into the room, and um, the father said, could you give me an hour, because I just took my wife off life support, and I can't have my whole family die in the same hour. All right? It took me seven years to cry again. In the perfect world, I would have processed. I would have sat down with the father and said, do you have any idea what your pain is doing to me? But it wasn't about me. And the other reality that we deal with every day is that you know that I had to go in the next room with another child who was dying. Right? So what do you do? You tuck it away. You put it in a box. That is called sanity. Right? That's called sanity. But then things keep coming. And you say, I'll deal with it later. I really will. I'll process it. I shall. But you don't. And things keep coming. So what happens? There are so many things that are in the box that the only way you can maintain your sanity is to build thicker walls. Thicker and thicker walls. Until this box that was the definition of containment and sanity suddenly becomes a leaden box. 
why lead? Because lead is, even a little bit of lead in your system is toxic to your intelligence. Why lead? Because even Superman can't see through lead. And why lead? Because it's too heavy to lift up. And when the most passionate themes of human existence are trapped inside of a leaden box, you stop feeling. And that's where professional burnout is. And for people like us, who do this because we care, it's worse than being stressed. It's worse to feel nothing because our feelings define us. And then someone opens up our lid, and what pours out is rage. And then somebody says, my goodness, Ken, you seem so angry. So let me tell you a little bit more about me. I have an ace score of zero. I have walked in a path of privilege in this lifetime, not historically by any means, but in my lifetime. My pain is that I bear witness to other people's pain. But for the kids who I serve, this is their life. And what happens is what they are seen as, they are seen in the context of their rage. What's wrong with you? Instead of being seen in the context of their life, what happens to you? And when they want these feelings to stop swirling, I recommend marijuana. Because marijuana is an amazing way of getting your feelings to slow down. And when they can't stand losing control, because losing control and having these random expression of emotions is overwhelming, so you want to control when, where, and how you erupt, I suggest alcohol. So this model explains a lot of what is going on. And there is a better way. Oh, and by the way, um, the, labels, um, the labels of what we see are discordant by race class. Right, just a fact, right? If you're white, you're more likely to be called attention deficit disorder. If you're a person of color, you're more likely to be called oppositional defiant conduct disorder and intermittent explosive disorder. I have a very serious problem with this, all right? There's a better way for us and for our kids. Building what I call a Tupperware box. Still a container. Containers define sanity, but the stuff inside it don't stink. You know what's there. You go through the process of emotional intelligence. You break it down. You know what's inside. In every one of these boxes is a story, a story that you see every day, but there's some that never leave you, and they're swirling inside, and you're working, you're doing an enormous amount of emotional labor trying to keep them inside. You know, there's, you know, Dorothy from South Dakota, Luis from New York, Miguel from Nicaragua, Michael from the streets of Philadelphia, who the adolescent medicine people are going to meet in a couple minutes, right? There's so, you know, that father, my own father stuff, there's so much inside. But I go through a process of emotional intelligence, and I make a decision. I'm going to deal with something, one thing. I'm going to open the lid. I'm going to pick on one subject. I'm going to release it in some way that finishes this mathematical sentence. I blank it out. Some form of expression. I cried it out. I laughed it out. In my case, I taught it out. This is why I do what I do, right? I prayed it out, I screamed it out, I sculpted it out, I wrapped it out, I, I um, slammed it out, I danced it out. I don't know you, but I do know that every person is the expert in their own life. And you, when you work with a human being, help them come up with a way to codify what has gone on in their life and to release it in a way that allows them to feel. And you release the pain, and you burp the box. And there's just a little bit less inside and more room for new experiences. Almost done. So how do we define success? You know, I'm an academic to you. I'm a professor, right? So I know that we're supposed to be measuring stuff. The problem is that most of the stuff is immeasurable. That's the problem, guys. Right? So go ahead, measure housing, measure pregnancy prevention, all of that, that's great. But understand that what we're trying to do here is prove that adolescents are capable of healing from trauma. Understand that the best thing that you can do in a human interaction is to prove that people are worthy of trust. Hang out with me, make me feel like you're worthy of trust, it's not going to affect my life. My life has been good. Work with someone who has been exploited and show them that you want nothing in return, over the long term, it's a game changer. Why do we love? We love so that young people know that they're worthy of being loved. 
We want to make it so that our youth are going to be more likely to pass along our love to their children and thereby break the cycle of trauma and oppression. We want to create the state of adolescent health that assures they're going to provide the optimal templates upon which to create the next generation. This science that's backfiring is also literally spiritually inspirational. We know that we can change a life and change their genes. We know they create different children when we do so. By making it so our young people can feel again. By creating the kind of environment where staff never forgets how to feel. So at the end of this talk, you're like, oh my God, I have so much to do. So many things on my plate. So many forms to fill out. So many epic buttons to Punch. Do you have epic? There you go. So many Cerna buttons to punch. All right. So many things that I have to do in primary care. 15 categories I have to do in my 13 minute visit. How can this little man come to me and tell me that now I have to love the children? Now I've got to add that to my list. But what I'm going to tell you is quite seriously that I've added nothing to your plate. We're talking about the place, the scaffolding upon which we raise kids, the scaffolding upon which we heal, the scaffolding upon which we build the next generation, the power of human connection that kids sees kids as they deserve to be seen, that holds them to the highest expectation, and that's not going anywhere. Thank you, guys. Have a good day. Do you questions? Okay. Questions. So I am spending a few hours with a few of you. Good. Questions, arguments, feelings? Well, congratulations. This is the only one lecture that I heard about this here in a hospital. I have been heard this in many other ways, but not here in a hospital. This is one of my major motto. I think that uh, love is what it cures everything. And uh, what is the difference when I, I have an intestinal rehabilitation program with short bowels, and the majority of the patients are, are kids from teenagers. And my outcomes are much, much better than out of the world. It's 98% against 40% of survivors. And they always ask me, what is the difference that you do and we don't do, we do the same thing that you. And my question is love. The question is love. And um, make these teenagers bond with the kids. Make these teenagers or the mothers bond with these kids that are abnormal. They don't want these kids. They tell me, do you want me to take care of these kids with lines, with ostomies, with Jesus? Are you crazy? You want me to? Resign my job to take care of these kids. Many mothers have been telling me this. But, but, but the major work that we have is this, is to create that bond, to put that mother to hold the kid, to carry the kid, to think, to, to say things, different things. Um, one day the, the residents, I told the residents, I love alternative medicine. And, they said, yes, what is your preference after that situation? And I said, love. Love is what makes the creation a difference between one action and the other action. And I showed them a kid who was uh, coming from the United Kingdom, from a king, very scared, very frightened, very malnourished. He was thinking, wanted that anybody touch him. And it was prohibited to touch him in, in that uh, Kuwait. So I said to the father, you know, I don't think that you come from the outside, the other world, just to visit Washington and not to have this baby. This baby, we are giving the max calories, everything, and this baby hasn't grown a gram. What I need is you. I need that you sit down and start rocking this baby, start singing, start talking. And if you are not able to do this, bring me somebody who does this, because we don't have to enough nurses for doing this. And this kid grows huge in one week 
of difference between one and the other thing with the same medicine. But this kind of medicine, we don't have time for this medicine. Here, every day is that, why you talk too much, is what they say to me. Why you spend this, you are not good with this, you, 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 are, you are taking too much fun. There was one, one thing that they told me, that you are spending too much in social things that we don't need to. So this is, a, 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 this is our medicine. We forgot to care about the kids. We forgot to watch them. I always tell the residents, the baby tells you what is wrong with them, if you want to hear. Even if they are one month, two months, they smile, they express you what they need. But you need to go there and talk with them. You need to go there and try to contact them. But our teaching is 12 hours in the computer, one second with the baby, or with the mother, or with this or with that. And when you talk too much, you are not productive at work, your RPU, and all the things that they measure you every day. They don't measure for what you are doing. So I, one question that I wanted to ask you, how do you measure love? Because here is everything, show me data. This is what the, the, the computer is here in this, in this environment. Show me your data. Oh, you are saying that it's love? Show me your data. How do you measure love? How do you measure different changes? Do you know how to do this? I asked one psychology and she told me that there are people now who are trying to do this. But I, I need to know. I wish you didn't end with a question because my intention was to just do this. You know what I mean by that? Drop the mic. Meaning I cannot imagine on a spiritual level in terms of what I'm trying to teach anything that I could say in response to that that was more beautiful or powerful than your words. And I'd love to just, the simple answer is we haven't figured it out yet, and we may never figure it out, and we're still right, right? Um, I, um, I don't want to comment on your words because your words were, like, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Please join us for coffee time. Um, I have a, a, a pleasurable task uh, at this point, and then once I figure out how to do this. Uh, yep, there we go. Um, Elder Arcee uh, was a faculty member uh, in our division. Um, from approximately uh, 1982 until uh, her untimely death in 2006. Uh, she was a wonderful faculty member who was absolutely dedicated to teaching. She was in the first class of master teachers here, and she set a standard for teaching uh, that our division has been trying to live up to, uh, sometimes successfully and sometimes not, over the course of the, uh, uh, the past uh, 12 years. Uh, obviously, bringing Ken here uh, raised our stock greatly. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, the Elder Arts and Teaching Award was created through the generosity of uh, Peter and Gabriel and Daniel Hammond uh, and the faculty and staff here at Children's uh, who contributed to it. It honors one or more faculty members annually who have made innovative contributions to, to patient, student, resident, or staff education and it's awarded to a Children's National Faculty member by their peers, okay? It's voted on by peers, and it supports educational endeavors. This is the list of uh, RC scholars from 2007 to 2016, and of course it includes uh, many wonderful teachers and we will continue to add to this list because we have many wonderful teachers. Uh, we are proud to tell you that this year's 
LRC Teaching Scholars Awards are Deb Rieger from the uh, Division of uh, Genetics and Kathy Ferrer uh, from the Division of Hospital Medicine. Uh, and I would like them to join me. We have actually made one presentation already at the awards ceremony, but this is the ceremony where they actually receive their award. So if you will please uh, join me in greeting Kathy and Deborah and acknowledging them for their significant contributions. Now I have to tell you a little story. And that little story is, is, is that on three occasions in the past five years, we've received the award and one of them has been broken. <laughs> And in order to continue that uh, that uh, tradition, that's right. I just get the broken one. Tradition is good. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. That's right. And and Dr. Ferrer gets the intact one for now. And and I can only promise, I agree, that we do get these repaired on an annual business. And today I made a firm declaration to my senior administrative assistant, Angela Ellis. I said, we're switching companies. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Yes, uh, um, the educational conference room? ID. ID, okay. Please join us for coffee in the ID conference room. Um, we would love to have you uh, there uh, to further the discussion with us. Thank you.